strikes at sea, mariners must battle more insidious foes than merely the hostile elements. The sea lays bare our greatest fears, exposes our secret frailties. Ultimately, each person in jeopardy on the waves must summon the will to survive, as did the 549 passengers and crew aboard the ill-fated Morrow Castle. America of 1930 was a place far different from the flourishing republic we know today. It was a melancholy landscape of bankrupt hopes and even bleaker dreams. Its citizenry littered with the hapless victims of the Great Depression. It was an era of desperate desires and diminished expectations. Once proud New York City, the setting of the stock market crash itself was especially hard hit. All along its waterfront, old, unused ships lay in their berths, tired symbols of American shipping's decline. Yet a tiny glimmer of optimism was just around the corner. In a move that bolstered the sagging maritime industry and provided for naval auxiliaries in the event of war, the U.S. government provided loans to the New York-based Ward Line to build two new luxury cruisers for its New York to Havana route. The two liners, the Morrow Castle and her sister ship Oriente, were designed by Theodore Ferris, America's foremost naval architect. The two vessels were expressly created to be the pride of the Ward Line. Thomas Torreson Jr. worked aboard the Morrow Castle as third assistant person. She was a beautiful ship. The Morrow Castle was around 500 some odd feet long, about 70 feet wide. She was kept immaculately clean. I thought she was a nice ship, and I've sailed on many ships since then, including the QE2. And I found that the Morrow Castle and the overall stood up very well. This ship was nicely designed with veneered paneling, light plywood. There were lush draperies and plush furniture everywhere. She was really designed after the great Atlantic liners of the 1920s and 1930s. They really wanted a lot of comfort. At 12 noon on a perfect spring day in 1930, the Morrow Castle was christened amidst high hopes and higher spirits in Newport News, Virginia. Attending the gala event could have foreseen the dark fate awaiting the sparkling new flagship of the Ward Line. By the fall of 1934, the Morrow Castle was docked at Pier 13 in Manhattan at the foot of Wall Street. There she proudly stood, her decks polished and gleaming, her crew smartly outfitted, a stark contrast to the downtrodden boulevard where so many dreams had been dashed just a few years earlier. Captain was Robert R. Wilmot, a veteran of the seas who had been with the war line for more than two decades. Captain Wilmot was a real gentleman, very popular with the passengers, very carefully inspected the ship every day. I think Wilmot was a tough skipper. I mean, you had to be, to be captain of a passenger liner. And I think that Captain Wilmot looked to get the very best out of his people. The Morrow Castle's chief officer and second in command was William Worms. Like Captain Wilmot, 
He had been with the ward line for more than 20 years. He was tough. A real sea dog type. When I first came on board, I went out on the deck and I talked to first officer Worms. And I made the mistake of saying, this is a beautiful boat. And he jumped all over me. He said, mister, this is a ship. Don't you ever call it a boat again. And I never had sense. <laughs> described in documents as being a driver of men, being a erratic, and this was a concern, apparently, of Captain Wilmot. Captain Wilmot's crew was a motley assortment of veteran officers and still green ordinary seamen. His chief engineer, Evan Abbott, had been at sea for most of his life. But some crew members who were hired had considerably less experience. Some people were qualified, others had falsified papers. But first of all, it must be remembered that the country was in depression. People were looking for work, people would do anything for work. The pay, because of the depression, was, was typically low uh, for, for the hours that the crew was required to put in. The crewing was a very tough business, there was a lot of demand, so that the members on the ship, if they left, would then lose their spot. That made the crew resentful. Captain Jeffrey Munro's father, Clarence Red Munro, was a 19-year-old able-bodied seaman aboard the Morrow Castle. Red saw the job as a way for the eldest of three children to help support a hungry, extended family. He was young, and like every other occupation, you start at an entry-level position and just work your way up. He signed aboard the ship as an ordinary seaman. After he had had a year sea time, he was able to sit for his AB certificate and then sail as an able seaman on the ship. And that's the position he occupied in 1934. When Thomas Torreson Jr. signed on as the Morrow Castle's third assistant purser, he was brimming with dreams of ocean-going adventure. He didn't realize that his new position would require him to master some unexpected talents. Because I didn't know anything about the job. The only requirement was, believe it or not, that you speak some Spanish and dance. Because one night a week, we had to attend the ship's masquerade ball and dance with the female passengers. Because there was always more girls than boys on board. The Morrow Castle's route was the vaunted trip from New York to Havana, then known as the gayest city in the Western world. The liquor and high times flowed freely in the wild and colorful Cuban port. Prices were surprisingly low, and the trip drew passengers of all kinds, from wealthy couples to young secretaries looking for a furtive thrill on the high seas. It was a very popular time for cruising. People could leave New York for as little as $60. They would leave Saturday afternoon, go to Havana, uh, arrive on a Tuesday, leave Wednesday, and be back in New York 7 o'clock on Saturday morning where they would discharge all the passengers and a new crop would come aboard. Actress model Dolly McTeague and her husband Sidney boarded the Morrow Castle in New York on September the 1st, 1934 for a honeymoon cruise with expectations of seafaring, romance, and relaxation. They were dancing at night, and they had a nice band. The food was good. We thought it was nice. On September the 4th, Captain Wilmot's magnificent vessel sailed into Havana Harbor, beneath the shadow of her namesake, the historic Morrow Castle Fort, standing sentinel over the city. Many of her passengers disembarked in order to sample the plentiful rum, hand-rolled cigars, and other more illicit pleasures of the Cuban capital. The 174th round-trip cruise of Morrow Castle had reached its halfway point, and her passengers, preparing to return to the drudgery of their everyday lives, must have felt they were in good hands with Captain Wilmot at the helm. After all, the line boasted that during its years of continuous service, the ward line has lost but two ships, and it has never lost a passenger. Still one more player in the Morrow Castle drama was perhaps laying up her plans. His name was George Rogers. He was the ship's chief radio officer 
and he possessed a dark side none of his fellow crew or passengers could have imagined. George Rogers is, without question, the most complex figure aboard the Morrow Castle on any of its previous voyages and on its last as well. He had a criminal history. He was sadistic all the way down the line. Did Chief Radio Officer Rogers bring his criminal secrets with him aboard the Morrow Castle? Or were there others on board with their own hidden motives for wanting the 174th voyage of the Ward Lines flagship to be its last? Sea Tales will return in a moment. The Krylon Touch means making the old look new. The Krylon Touch and the boring becomes beautiful. Show your true colors. Don't just pay, give it the cry. The tea, however, had been disappointed by a small mishap that kept us stranded on board ship. When I was getting off the ship, I fell over one of the wires and I sprained my ankle, so I never did get into port. <laughs> Leave it to me. <laughs> Captain Robert Wilmot set his course, and the Morrow Castle, the fastest turboelectric liner in the world, steamed homeward through calm waters at 21 knots. But a palpable tension was beginning to spread throughout the ship. There was concern because of a storm approaching, and there was concern also over the health of Captain Wilmot who had, on a previous voyage, uh, a bout of indigestion and apparently had been complaining of it again. And Wilmot was not showing up for some dinners, and that was noticed by the passengers. Some passengers and crew had sensed an uneasiness in the normally unflappable captain, and now intrigue made its way to his quarters the first time this trip. Wilmot summoned Chief Radio Officer George Rogers to his cabin for a tense discussion. According to Rogers, Captain Wilmot expressed concerns about second radio operator George Aladner, who had helped to organize a wildcat strike against the ward line a few months earlier and was considered a subversive. I had been warned about him when I first got on the ship not to have anything to do with him because he was supposed to be a communist. And back in those days, the idea of communism or a communist, the picture of the cartoon that's put out was a long black coat and a black hat and a big beard, the guy carrying a bomb. Presumably referring to a Lagner, Wilmot allegedly told the chief radio operator there would be changes once the ship docked in New York. But whether those changes involved a Lagner or Rogers himself deepened the shipboard intrigue. <laughs> By Friday the 7th, passengers and crew alike were excitedly preparing for the captain's dinner, a traditional party held on the last night of a cruise. Dolly McTeague and her new husband were looking forward to the dinner with special enthusiasm. We were invited to sit at the captain's table the, the last night, and that we thought was great. Their excitement was to be short-lived. As the ship neared Cape Hatteras, she entered the freshening gale of an approaching nor'easter. Third assistant purser Thomas Torreson received a panicked phone call at his station. And it was the bridge asking to get Dr. Van Zyl, a ship surgeon, up to the captain's cabin right away. Captain Wilmot was discovered in the uh, bathtub, slumped into the bathtub in his cabin. There was no visible sign of any beating, struggle, etc. Artificial resuscitation was attempted to no avail. He was pronounced dead from acute indigestion and heart failure. A tray of food had been brought to Captain Wilmot's cabin that evening. Had he died of heart failure as the ship's surgeon surmised? Or was it possible that someone had poisoned him, setting the stage for the events that would follow? Proudly sitting down to dine at the captain's table a few minutes later, Dolly McTeague and her husband were shocked by an officer's announcement. Ladies and gentlemen, I have some tragic news. Captain Wilmot has suffered a heart attack and has passed away. Tonight's celebration is cancelled. Some suspicious passengers and crew immediately suspected foul play. 
People conjecture that he was poisoned. People say that, oh, there were people out to get him, that uh, he was out to get other people. I didn't think he had a heart attack because he was fine. And just like that, he had a heart attack just before dinner. So something was fishy there. We all thought that there was something wrong. It seemed that intrigue had paid a second visit to the ship in as many days. Chief Officer William Warms quickly assumed command as acting captain of the Morro Castle, which was now headed into more threatening weather, with winds of increasing velocity buffeting the waters of the Atlantic. Some believe that Captain Wilmot himself hadn't trusted Warms to pilot the ship in his absence. Warms came to the Morro Castle with more or less of a blemished record in some regards. He had lost his license on one previous occasion for failure to hold lifeboat drills. Pitching seas and gloom over the news of Captain Wilmot's death had sent most of the passengers to their berths for the evening. And as the midnight hour of September the 7th, 1934 passed, most of the Morrow Castle's 316 passengers settled into slumber. With a new captain in place, the Morrow Castle steamed northward toward New York City at 18 knots. At 2.40 in the morning, the night watchman walking around on deck begins to smell something odd. Ten minutes later, he thinks that there may be something wrong in the writing room. And he calls the bridge and he says, Captain, I smell and I see smoke. There was little reason to believe that the fire was anything to be worried about. Captain Worms confidently assumed that his crew would take care of the problem without disturbing the passengers. It could be nothing more than a cigarette burning in a waste paper basket. So the captain immediately tells the third officer, go down and investigate. Look in that passageway on A, and then continue down to the writing room. Go all the way to D if you have to, and let me know. Confident in the Morrow Castle's state-of-the-art fire detection system, Worms maintained his speed at 18 knots and his course straight into a steady 20-knot squall. The amount of smoke is more significant. It looks like it's coming from a locker at the after end of the writing room. They open up the locker, and the locker literally burst into flames. Hackney calls the bridge, says, you'd better get the crew out. I have a real problem down here. Acting Captain Warms was just miles up the coast of New Jersey and only a few short hours from the successful completion of an unexpectedly trying journey. He undoubtedly looked forward to a commendation for taking the reins of the Morrow Castle after Captain Wilmot's untimely death and perhaps to making this grand ship his own one day soon. What he didn't know as he stood at her bridge staring at the rain-lashed night sky was that beneath his feet the mighty Morrow Castle was turning into a blazing inferno. Sea tales will return in a moment. I never thought it could be this simple. I can't even program a VCR, and I'm online. America Online makes doing all the things you do crept past. A fire raged aboard the Ward Line luxury liner Morrow Castle. Most of the passengers and crew were fast asleep when the blaze was first discovered. Third assistant purser Thomas Torreson was among those catching up on some much needed rest. The second assistant purser, fellow named Les Harrison, and I, we slept in a cabin in the aft of the ship on D-deck. So I got into bed around midnight, one o'clock or something like that. Dead tired because I'm on my feet from six o'clock in the morning. By 2.56 a.m., the indicator bulbs on the ship's fire detection system lit up across the board, and Captain Worms came to a horrible realization. The Morrow Castle was burning out of control. The next thing we know was a pounding on our door, and there's a crew member from the engine department saying, hey, fellas, the ship's on fire. Get dressed to get up on deck and help calm the passengers. Sounded the general alarm, ordering the passengers to be awakened. Just 
just after he sounds the general alarm, he orders the ship hard left in an attempt to put her into a lee and maybe get her toward the Jersey Shore. Hard of port! Hard of port! Swing her as far as she'll go! The ship begins to take a round turn to port. And then they lose steering. As their ship staggered out of control in a raging storm, crew members fought to free lifeboats from the upper decks before they too were consumed by the inferno. Well, I went up to the person's office forward on the forward uh, lobby there. So I said to the person, Bob, how bad is it? And he said, go take a look. And he pointed up the B deck. It was a massive flames at that point. The person that gave us each an order, I was to go on the, the port side, check every room, be sure the passengers are out. In an aft cabin on the ship's passenger deck, Dolly McTeague's honeymoon was about to take a terrifying turn. My husband woke up, and he had heard yelling and screaming out in the hall, and he woke me up. And he said, Skip, he called me Skip. Skip, get up, get up. I think the boat's on fire. Because you could see the, the part of the smoke. It was 3 o'clock in the morning, and it was freezing. Still steaming into the wind at 18 knots, the Morrow Castle was soon a floating cord in the flames. The ship, because she's built for the tropic trade, has excellent ventilating systems. And oxygen is being carried to fan the fire on the vessel. The way the wind was hitting it, plus the direction of the, and speed of the ship, was such that it forced the flames back. And this started to chase the passengers backward, cut them off from the lifeboats. It cut officers off from Captain, acting Captain Warms. The blaze in the ships effectively sliced the vessel in two, with Worms and his officers stranded on the bridge, and the panicked, screaming passengers stampeding toward the stern. A convulsive wave of hysteria swept over the boat. I actually saw that fire floating down the whole length of the deck. It was like a big wave rolling down. And uh, the fire actually was a raging inferno. More than you would find from an ordinary fire. A few valiant crew members picked up the fire hoses on deck and aimed them toward the fast-moving blaze. But due to a shutdown boiler and several open hoses that had been abandoned in the face of the advancing fire, they discovered to their horror that there was hardly any water pressure. Amidst this inferno, Thomas Torreson tried his best to shepherd passengers to safety. If you look at a picture of the ship, you'll notice that the boats in the Davis were on A-deck. And the idea was you launched the boat, you lowered the davit down to B deck where the passenger was supposed to get on board. That was where the fire was, so they couldn't get there. Brave crew members were breaking out porthole windows, allowing passengers to escape from their cabins. But in doing so, they were unwittingly providing new fuel for the deadly fire. At 3 10 a.m., another level of fear overtook the ship as her electrical system failed, plunging her into total darkness. Warns was losing more control of the Morrow Castle each minute. By now, she was a fiery orange ball in the ocean, visible even amidst the gale that enveloped her. The officers tell the captain, if you don't get the lifeboats over the side, they're going to burn up because the fire is already beginning to consume uh, the upper deck. So he orders what crew is available into the lifeboats and says, get the boats over the side as quickly as possible and have them go to the stern of the ship so that if passengers begin to jump over the side, they can get into the lifeboats. Chief Radio Officer George Rogers, with the radio room melting around him, pressed Captain Worms for the order to send the SOS. Rogers was one of the few men who seemed to still have some measure of composure amidst the disaster. I was in complete control of myself and saw the situation clearly. I knew what I had to do and why. I remember I was...
was grateful for this at the time because the fire was spreading and someone had to have his wits about him. At 3.18 a.m., Worms finally gave the order and Rogers sent the belated distress signal. Worms ordered the crew to abandon ship. He still underestimated the extent of the blaze and believed he might somehow save the vessel from annihilation. are blowing at 35, 40 knots, the seas to 25 to 30 feet high. And these boats hit the water, get slammed up against the side of the ship, and people are thrown all over the place in the boats. Oars go out, uh, you know, equipment that's in a boat gets slammed around. And because the ship is still moving, the lifeboats are literally left in the wake of the vessel and cannot stay up alongside. As the blaze heightened in intensity, some passengers burned to death in their staterooms. Others huddled on deck, cursing the crew who were already in lifeboats but unable to stay close enough to the ship to rescue them. Many, like Dolly McTeague, were considering jumping into the storm-tossed waters of the Atlantic Ocean. We were looking for the lifeboats. And we ran downstairs, commotion, commotion, everybody screaming. Nobody could tell us, you know, where to go, what to do or not, what not to do. Consequently, when we got down, looked for the boats, there were no boats. Crowds, crowds of people were pushing and pushing to get near the railing. They thought if they jumped overboard that, you know, it would be better because the fire was getting really intense. Dolly McTeague and the others aboard the Morrow Castle faced a wrenching decision. Stay on the ship and perish in the advancing flames, or take their chances in the turbulent Atlantic.